Thank you, moderator. Um, my Lord uh, Chief Justice, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen of protocols observed, uh, a good afternoon. Mine is going to be very simple because um, Imam has done a fantastic job uh, because when I was asked to speak about ICT uh, in the justice sector and specifically about cybersecurity, I had a couple of questions. I asked myself, so we're talking about justice, but at the same time we're talking about ICT. How do the two go together? Uh, and I believe Kasha Tu on the team have done a fantastic job of showing actually how those two go together. But um, just to set a, I hope this is going to be able to work. There you go. So this was just to give you a background, but I think Emab has actually gone through uh, this process. Rwanda at a glance. I'm sure this is not new to anyone now. Uh, with good leadership, we've been able to rank uh, in a number of, you know, areas. Uh, some are quite good, but we want to even achieve more. Uh, policy, and uh, Imabra again has gone through this. Who are the actors behind the ICT uh, digitization agenda? Those are the institutions. Uh, now, in terms of digital transformation, this is a journey that started in, uh, in the year 2000. And what have we done uh, since that time? First of all, we had a 20-year plan that was broken down into uh, four components or five years each. Uh, back in the days, we used to call it NICI, which means National Information Communication Infrastructure. Uh, but we transformed the last batch, which we're in now, is called Smart Rwanda Master Plan. So today we are doing that. And uh, the very first uh, enabling environment was to set up the infrastructure, but also to come up with a policy, which is uh, a couple of slides you see the number of policies, but I think Imam has touched on them. Then the second phase was to lay down infrastructure, fiber optic. We have more than 7,000 kilometers of fiber across the country. Uh, we have 95% coverage of uh, 4G LTE, um, and we have other different uh, areas that we've covered in terms of infrastructure, data center, and uh, other systems that we have in place. Then we started to go into now uh, services that are provided, which I'm going to uh, tackle on in, um, in a couple of minutes. Now, the Smart Rwanda Master Plan resides on about seven pillars uh, with cross-cutting uh, elements and I believe uh, this is where we're going to concentrate in terms of cyber security. So these are the policies again. We've gone through them. What have we achieved? A number of things. I just touched on them. The 4G coverage, fiber optic. Uh, we've transitioned from the analog to digital in terms of uh, TV and radio and all that. The entire infrastructure is now running on digital. Um, we, I think this is a bit outdated. We have slightly uh, close to uh, actually 90% uh, population uh, coverage in terms of mobile penetration. So we've started to go into a number of applications of ICT in different sectors. Um, this is a program that has been there for quite some time, one laptop per child, but uh, smart classroom concept is a concept that through the Ministry of Education is being driven across the country. There are a number of, of academic institutions that are preparing the next generation of actors within the digital space and this is how they are all aligned together. And have, you know, we have CMU, we have AIMS, we have other centers of excellence across the country that are doing different things in IT, IoT, big data, cyber security, GIS, you know, and uh, all other disciplines. All these are geared towards producing uh, a cohort of uh, uh, digital uh, actors. In the health uh, sector, 
Um, a number of systems are in place, but we are working now on how do we consolidate the health sector and make sure that it is able to offer different services. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with the zip line a story, uh, together with other areas like Candela and uh, you know uh, Volkswagen. It has an application that is built in the vehicle that was developed by Rwandans. Uh, it's now being used. So in terms of e-government, we have Ilium, a platform that has been in operation since 2014, and uh, we have an agent network of 3,200. Here we are talking about more than 200 services that are offered through this platform. And uh, on a yearly basis, they serve uh, more than three to four million citizens that are served through uh, uh, Enable platform. So these are other number of difference. Today in Rwanda, in public sector, procurement is done electronically. You announce the tender, uh, bidders bid online, even contracts are signed digitally. Now we come to cyber security. From the year 2004, and uh, actually uh, 11, the government of Rwanda decided to embark on making sure that we secure the infrastructure we're putting in place. Um, it started off by the policy and the procedures that were put in place. A cyber security center was established. Uh, it operates 24 hours. And what does it do? We do monitoring. We do detection. And we actually do response. We do respond in instances where there is an issue that comes out. We respond. We do analysis. Uh, we do. Um, we try to assess what ex the root cause, the source, and everything. But this is running on an infrastructure that I mentioned, which uh, is uh, the fiber backbone, but also running through the digital, the national data center, but also the national public key infrastructure. What does that mean or what does it do? This is an infrastructure that helps us to digitally sign different documents. For example, the uh, e-procurement process runs on uh, the national public key infrastructure. You are given a digital given a token that allows you to sign uh, your documents uh, digitally. But what are the economic implications of uh, cyber crime globally? We have about 39 um, a hack or an attack happens every 39 seconds. So just think about every 39 seconds an attack happens somewhere in the whole world. The average cost of data breach will be, next year, will be around $150 billion. And by 2021, we're talking about cost of about $6 trillion globally being spent on cybercrime in one way or another. So it's a big industry. So some guys who want to make money will go there but the wrong kind of money. So this is what we have to grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis, and it, it, it's in different areas. Actually, there is a hack now for everything that we go into. Those who have wearables, there's a hack for it. There's a hack for vehicles. There's a hack for, you know, you can connect your Bluetooth onto your vehicle, and you can you know, access internet on, in your car. So there's a hack for everything. So that's why we're putting in place infrastructure to be able to mitigate against this. But the interesting question that we ask ourselves, if today somebody is able to hack into my vehicle and cause an accident, if I am lucky and able to know who did it, how actually do you prosecute that person? Do we have legal instruments that enable us to prosecute uh, a person who has done that? So in Rwanda, we are lucky. Last year, a law was enacted that defines what are cyber crimes and what are the commensurate 
um, uh, punishments that go with what type of crimes. But I must say that this is a continuous exercise that has to continue to go on because new and emerging technologies are going to come. These guys are going to think of creative ways of how to cause havoc using these tools. So I believe uh, our partners uh, from the law side have to also uh, keep up with working on how do you actually uh, get uh, some of these uh, crimes to have laws in place to be able to punish some of these crimes. So, cyber security is it's a framework. So you have on one side you have to align with the industry and then you have to also understand what are the activities, what are the actual actions that actually happen. So, some of the cases that we face are very interesting in nature. Somebody calls you and says that, uh, my name is Innocent. Uh, actually, I work for MTN. Uh, you have been selected to uh, win a prize of um, 5 million uh, run on francs. Uh, but for you to do it, you actually need to uh, do this and that. Uh, and maybe you're asked to send a small amount of money, which is, let's say, 25,000. Later on, you realize, actually, that was a fake call. This actually, you have been duped, and you've lost 20 or 30,000 francs. Is that a cyber crime? So, by having a comprehensive framework, you're able, actually, to define the boundaries and be able to even have those such a crimes that sit on the boundary of where you are not able to understand what it means, uh, whether it's a cyber crime or not. If it's not, then how do you uh, litigate that? So we have a framework that we use uh, where there are specific domains here. For example, we're talking about, let's say, financial services as a domain, talking about telecom, energy. Then you have uh, processes, and then you have have the, the hardcore uh, engineering part that enables you to uh, handle uh, cyber crimes. Then when you're there, you have to identify, protect, detect, respond, and in cases, have to uh, recover from a particular breach. Uh, and I believe at that stage, that's where uh, you go into litigation and stuff like that. Now, there's one big challenge, and we are very happy here to have, you know, policy makers, decision makers, and executives. It is something that the executives have to own. Unfortunately, it's an area that very few executives understand, but it has to be owned at that level. Because looking at the monetary implications, it's not something that we leave to the technical operators or the tacticians. It has to be understood. It has to be appreciated at that level. Because if you go into the commercial uh, settings, I uh, had a presentation in the bank banking sector and I asked a question. In the board, boards of different banks, how many people or what organization has a board that has at least one person who understands cybersecurity implications? And none of them. Now, if take any bank, that does not have somebody sitting at the board, a board that makes decisions, that gives guidance to the management, and if they do not understand the implications of cybersecurity, I think it's a big mistake. Because what is going to affect them? Uh, theft today, very rarely will you get somebody to come and take cash. Because wh why would they have to buy? They are going to sit in Nicaragua, China, Rwanda, or whatever, they're going to hack into your financial system. They're going to hit you with millions of dollars. Swift Network was hit by $85 million uh, in Bangladesh. Bangladesh or Indonesia? I, I don't remember. I yeah. So it has to be owned at that level. Now, the other thing is it's not a competition. The challenge here is that you find that there are people who are 
you know, compete. Let's take the rival out of it, collaboration, and collaborate on this because we are in it together. We have to collaborate. All different actors have to work together to ensure that um, this, ensure that we win this war. We might win a battle on one side, but for us to win a war, we have to be together. So these are some of the services that the Rwanda Cyber Security Center offers. Um, of course, awareness, we conduct our awareness campaign. We'd, we've been doing it every year, but we're trying to increase the pace at least to get a level where we can be able to do it quarterly. Um, the protection services we deploy across the network, uh, different government institutions. Um, so for that matter, ICMS is behind um, our network infrastructure that detects a, a number of different uh, uh, activities that are taking place. Then we do forensic assessment if at all there's anything that has happened. Now, to be able to bring it home, what do we see? Um, web def defacement or web hacking is one of the most prevalent activities that we see in Rwanda. What does that mean? this mean? It means somebody is able to take over your website and change it. So all the different websites that we monitor, we see this activity as one of the most prevalent uh, activities uh, the bad guys are trying to do. We see malicious files that come. Uh, these are targeted different uh, systems, different institutions that are aimed at um, are trying to uh, uh, infiltrate into your network. So what they do normally, they send a, a malicious file that comes, sits in your network, gathers information, or gives the, uh, bad guys access into your network. Uh, unauthorized access, um, this, we see it uh, quite a lot. It's, it's increasing pace, uh, and uh, this is technically what people call hacking or whatever. But then there are other things that are coming up. For instance, information gathering. It might not necessarily be um, it's a scavenging. People try to gather information. So by gathering information, what happens, eventually they are able to uh, target you directly. There's a case that happened a couple of years. Um, uh, it was not in Rwanda, but somewhere else. The CFO of a particular organization had traveled. But because of information gathering, these guys were able to know that he has traveled. So what they did, they just duped and called his office and they asked his office to send him money. And actually, money was sent. And now the question is, how did they know that he had traveled? How did they know what country he was in? How did they know that, uh, what thresholds to be able to send in terms of money? So this is happening. And then, of course, uh, computer malware. So these are some of the things that we do. And uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, we monitor systems. We work with different organizations uh, to be able to see um, how do we protect uh, our systems together. Thank you so much.